I don't usually make videos about Fedora because I generally like to look at the changes in the desktop experience and well Fedora's experience is Gnome's experience and I already have a video about Gnome 45. But this time around there's a device involved, the Fedora Slimbook. And so with this sort of official hardware for Fedora, I thought it would be cool to look at the distro and at the hardware you can get to run it. So let's take a look at Fedora 39, at the Fedora Slimbook, an excellent laptop for Fedora users, and at this excellent sponsor. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, and you probably have heard about them by now, but if you haven't, just know that they're your all-in-one solution to build your own website, however complex or simple you want it to be. You can completely customize the website to look and feel and have the features that you want. You have a big selection of templates and then you can rearrange them by just dragging and dropping blocks into place. You can change the general colors, you can add new pages and you have a big library of modules like a complete online shop with online payment or a members only area, a video gallery. You can even pick your own domain name and book it from Squarespace and they even have a module to design your own logo. So if you need a website but you don't really know how to get started or you don't have the time or the technical skills, just head over to squarespace.com slash the Linux experiment or click the link in the description below and you'll get 10% off your first purchase. So let's begin with what you will get under the hood with Fedora 39. First, the installer is still the old Anaconda, not the new one. Work is progressing fast but it wasn't done just yet so you will get it at most in Fedora 40. Second, you're getting the Linux kernel 6.5, which notably improves boot times on Xeon and Epic CPUs, so mostly for servers. But it also has performance improvements for X4 and better FS, it has better rumble support for Xbox controllers, it has AMD FreeSync being enabled by default, and better power management on Intel CPUs. Fedora 39 also drops the modular repos, as most users didn't use them, and this should speed up the DNF package manager as it no longer has to check these repos. Speaking of DNF, you're not getting DNF5 yet. It just wasn't ready for this release, and since it also wasn't ready for Red Hat Enterprise Linux 10, it's now been pushed to Fedora 41. Other changes include dropping the custom theming for cute apps. KDE applications launched in GNOME won't use a GNOME lookalike theme that tended to break apps, they will use the default cute theme which doesn't look too good. Fedora 39 also changes the default color of the terminal with the base prompt being green which should help legibility when typing long commands to better notice where your command begins. Finally, there is a new spin of Fedora Silver Blue, the immutable distro, but this time with Budgie as its desktop. It's called Fedora Onyx and it joins Silver Blue and Kinoite in the lineup of immutable spins of Fedora. Plenty of changes to the backend of the distro and plenty of missed deadlines as well for the new installer and for DNF5, but I guess it's better to push these to a future release than to ship them in a half-broken state. Now, of course, the biggest changes to your experience on Fedora will be with GNOME 45. I already covered it in a lot of detail in its dedicated video, but here is a small recap of everything you can expect. So, the first change will be to activities with the new workspaces indicator. When you click it, it opens the activities view, but visually it now shows your current virtual desktop as an elongated pill and the other virtual desktops as small circle. It is very helpful to let you know where you are in this strip of virtual desktops, although it won't tell you which apps are on which desktop. You can also scroll over it to move between virtual desktops. Now the application name menu also disappeared from the top bar in the process. This menu only included pretty redundant actions, so it got the boot, but it still makes it a little bit harder to know which app is currently in focus. In the quick settings, you now get the ability to control keyboard backlight on supported devices. You can click the button to turn that on or off, or expand it to select the brightness level. You can also open the quick settings menu by pressing Super plus S, and you can now click a background app to open its window. And you'll also get a small indicator when closing one of these background apps. Finally, in the top bar, you will get a new webcam activity indicator. 
When an app is accessing your webcam through Pipewire, you will see a small icon in there. GNOME 45 very slightly revamps the mouse cursors, but the changes are very, very subtle. And there is also a true light theme available, although you will have to enable it using dconf or through an extension. It makes the top bar and all the shell elements light themed. Apart from that, there's a new split header bar look that reached a few apps like the settings, the calendar, or the file manager. It cuts the header bar in two for apps that have a sidebar, and it does look pretty good. So basically, not a lot of visual or functional changes to the whole desktop experience. It's still GNOME, it still looks like Advita, which can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on whether you like it or not. I personally think it looks absolutely great. Now, in terms of applications, Nautilus gained a way faster search. Tracker, the search backend, has been improved and can cache query results, which means it's noticeably faster. And once you have completed a search, you can also get a search everywhere button that lets you search the whole file system, not just the current folder and its subdirectories. You also get a nicer experience in Nautilus when changing which columns you want to see in the list view with the ability to apply these changes to the current folder or to all directories. GNOME 45 also brings a new image viewer called Loop. It looks really good and it supports touchpad and touchscreen gestures to move between images and to zoom in and out. It has all the usual features you would expect from an image viewer as well. Cheese, the camera app, is replaced with Snapshot, a simpler but better performing application, and GNOME Calendar gained infinite scrolling in the month view and a revamped events dialog. Gnome Console got a new preference item to customize fonts, Gnome Maps gained a new experimental vector-based tile set, and the Connections app, which is used to handle remote desktops, now supports copying text, files, and images through the RDP protocol. The Gnome Font Viewer, Simple Scan, and the Baobab Disk Usage Analyzer also got ported to GTK4, and finally, the Calculator app now handles more currencies and more currency conversions. So that's a lot of small updates to the core apps of GNOME. The base experience is unchanged, but everything got a little bit better or faster. As per GNOME software, you can now clear all the user data associated with a Flatpak app when you uninstall it. And you will see messages in the search results and app details page to let you know if a Flatpak is end of life and hasn't received updates in a long time. And for GNOME's backend, you will get improvements to the Mutter compositor. It now supports the YUV color space, and it supports the recent Wayland fractional scaling protocol for things to not be too blurry and also way more power efficient. The mouse pointer is also handled in its own thread of the compositor, which means less latency and smoother movement when your device is under load. And finally, in terms of settings, you gain a new About page with more information about your device, you can close all pop-ups by pressing Escape, and you can customize the clock in the top bar. So that's GNOME 45. If you want to learn more about every single change, you can click the link in the description of the video to see all the changes to GNOME 45. But on Fedora, it feels super smooth, super fast and responsive. And especially on Wayland, it is a wonderful experience. But now let's talk hardware, the Fedora Slimbook. This is a partnership between Fedora and, you guessed it, Slimbook, the Linux hardware manufacturer based in Spain. It is a 16-inch laptop that only weighs 1.5 kilos or 3.3 pounds. And thanks to small bezels, it basically occupies the same space as a traditional 15-inch laptop. It has a 2K 16x10 display at 2560x1600. So that fractional scaling support in GNOME 45 might come in handy. And it refreshes at 90 Hz. It supports 100% of sRGB and it has a brightness of 400 nits and an anti-glare coating. The contrast ratio is also pretty high. It is a very, very nice panel to use. The laptop also has some cool Fedora branding with a super key using the Fedora logo. And you also get a Fedora logo with some text on the top left corner of the laptop. Although you also get a Slimbook logo on the top right as well, which might be a bit too much branding for some people. I would personally have preferred just the Fedora logo in the middle of the lid instead of the dual branding with text, which looks kind of off to me. The chassis is a magnesium and aluminium alloy, pretty durable and very lightweight. It's sort of a middle point between aluminium and plastic in terms of feel. It's less sturdy than aluminium, but it is way more robust and premium feeling than basic plastic. 
I used a lot of laptops using this kind of material and they do hold up pretty well over time. They have a nice feel, they don't start creaking or moving around like plastic can do and they scratch less easily than plastic, although you don't want to put your keys in the same bag as this because yes, it's gonna show scratches. In terms of specs, you get an Intel i7-12700H, which is a 14-core CPU with 6 performance cores and 8 efficiency cores that can go up to 4.7 GHz. It is paired with an NVIDIA RTX 3050 Ti with 4 gigs of RAM. This might surprise you, as Fedora is generally more on the open source side of things, and here again they sort of did that as well. You don't have the NVIDIA drivers pre-installed on this device, it's using the Nuvo drivers. So you will have to enable third-party repos at first start, and then you will have to install the NVIDIA drivers from GNOME software. By default, it's using the Nuvo drivers and, of course, the Mesa drivers for the integrated Intel GPU. I didn't have any problems using the laptop with just the Nuvo drivers, although if you really want to use the most out of your NVIDIA GPU, you're gonna have to use the proprietary drivers. They're not pre-installed by default because, well, Fedora doesn't ship these drivers by default, so they wanted a vanilla experience. Still, once you install those NVIDIA drivers, in my experience, it's really, really solid, even using Wayland. Multi-monitor works perfectly, I encountered no weird bugs or compatibility problems, everything feels smooth and very nice, just like on any laptop I used with an NVIDIA GPU and GNOME. The preconceived notion that NVIDIA really doesn't work well on Linux or really doesn't support Wayland is just that, a preconceived notion. It's not 100% perfect in all use cases, but in GNOME it works really, really well. I've been using NVIDIA GPUs and Linux and Wayland and either GNOME or KDE for a long while and I have not encountered a lot of problems. And for people who really do not want to use this, they can always switch to X11. Now, on top of that, you get to pick between 16, 32, or 64 gigs of RAM, running at 3200 MHz. It's not soldered, so you can upgrade it yourself down the line. As per storage, you get 500 gigs of SSD by default, with the ability to fill two M.2 slots with up to 4 terabytes in total. In terms of I.O., the laptop comes with two USB-A ports, which are 3.2 Gen 1, it comes with one USB-C 3.2 Gen 2 port that supports DisplayPort 1.4 and also one Thunderbolt 4 port that supports charging and DisplayPort, but it's hardwired to the integrated Intel GPU. There's also an HDMI port wired to the NVIDIA GPU, a headphone jack and an SD card slot plus a barrel charger port. You'll get Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.2 and an 82 watt hour battery that in my experience gives you about 6 to 7 hours of regular use, so web browsing, writing, watching the occasional video over Wi-Fi at mid-brightness. Finally, it has two speakers that are solid enough and have decent sound and bass, a 1080p webcam that isn't terrible, but also not that great, and a mic that's really mediocre. And if you're thinking, I've seen this laptop before, then yes, you have, because it's the Executive 16 or the equivalent Tuxedo Infinity Book Pro 16, which are both laptops I reviewed on this same channel. Which means that it also has a wonderful feeling keyboard with well-separated, super stable keys that I really, really love typing on. It has a giant touchpad, which feels absolutely fantastic to use. It's the best touchpad I used on any laptop including a recent MacBook Pro, especially for all the gestures that GNOME has to navigate the desktop and the apps. The only thing some people might not like is the numpad. I personally really love having one, but I know some people don't. You can also disable half of the touchpad by double pressing its top right corner if you feel like it's too big. It is a really fantastic laptop. Well built, nice looking, powerful, great keyboard, great touchpad, really good screen. It's a wonderful device. I like the form factor so much that after using one for a year, a Slimbook Executive 16, I moved to the equivalent at Tuxedo with a bit more powerful internals, but it's the exact same form factor keyboard and touchpad because I just don't want to use another laptop now. This laptop goes for 1700 euros for the 16 gigs of RAM, 500 gigs of SSD configuration, which is pretty decent. If you compare it with offerings from Dell or Samsung, for the same specs, the same form factor and the same build quality, you're generally paying a bit more with Dell or Samsung and you're not getting the dedicated GPU. 
At least that's what I found when trying to find equivalent devices on Amazon in France with all the VAT applied because that's 1700 euros with VAT included. And 3% of the sales go to the GNOME Foundation to help fund the development of GNOME and in turn to help improve Fedora. So Fedora 39 is a very solid update to Fedora 38. I can't see any reason you might not want to upgrade. It missed a few interesting changes like DNF5 to finally have a relatively speedy package manager and the new installer, which is definitely needed as the current one has really bad UX with buttons in all the wrong places and a hub design that is hard to understand at first. And it's also nice that it now has its own laptop to shine on. The Fedora Slimbook is a really good device. I've been using the exact same thing without the Fedora branding for more than a year. And the experience is wonderful, even with Wayland and Nvidia. And if you want to support Fedora and Gnome and you want a new, nice, big 16 inch laptop that is well designed and works really well, then there's the Fedora Slimbook. I left a link to it in the description below. They did not sponsor this video, by the way. So this will conclude this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications or to write a comment. And if you didn't like it, well, you can always click that dislike button and tell me why in the comments as well. And if you really enjoyed the channel, I left plenty of links in the description to support the channel from LibraPay, Patreon, PayPal, YouTube memberships, YouTube thanks, whatever, you know how this works. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.